In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers to tell them what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Daniel 2, 1-3 this dream of Nebuchadnezzar's came before his conversion, and as was the norm for a pagan king, he was surrounded by the usual array of astrologers and sorcerers connected with the mysteries, those who would seek to draw their supernatural powers of interpretation from Satan. They couldn't decipher the dream. Daniel, however, could. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to the things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Notice first of all that Daniel establishes that God is the real source of wisdom and revealer of mysteries and hidden things. Satan claims to have the secret knowledge that he disseminates through his mystery religion, but actually God is the omniscient one. Notice how Daniel also emphasizes that he does not know the interpretation because he has more knowledge than others. He makes it clear that he is simply relying on God. We should start noticing how much of the Old Testament tells of a constant battle between two kingdoms. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold its chest and arms of silver, its bellies and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will rise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united, any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. So the dream was a prophetic one that explained in the form of a statue how the Babylonian kingdom would have three successors that would follow after it. The statue, of course, was human to represent the fact that these kingdoms were made by man for man's glory, as Babylon originally had been. The first kingdom, symbolized by the head of gold, was the Babylonian Empire itself. Daniel then states that the head of gold empire would be followed by an inferior empire, symbolized by arms of silver. Christian scholars generally regard this to be the Medo-Persian Empire, which in 539 BC conquered the Babylonian Empire. The two arms symbolically refer to the two groups, the Medes and the Persians. The third kingdom was symbolized by the statue's belly and thighs of brass. Scholars believe this is a reference to the Grecian Empire, which conquered and then came after the Medo-Persian Empire. 
The symbol of a belly and thighs of brass suggests that the kingdom was to start out as a united empire, but end up as a divided empire. Under the leadership of Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire was indeed a united empire, but after Alexander's death, the empire was divided up. It was around this time when Greece was the dominant power that the mystery Babylon religion became known as Gnosticism. The word Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. Gnostics still believed that humans were divine souls stuck within imperfect human bodies created by an imperfect god. They still believed there was a second and superior god who provided them with the esoteric knowledge necessary to become gods themselves. Ashtoreth had taken on the name Sophia because Sophia means wisdom in Greek. The serpent was portrayed as the good father of Cain. Yahweh was portrayed as an unreasonable god who had cursed Adam and Eve wrongly after a temper tantrum. High priestesses were ordained through sexual rituals. There were still blood oaths, secret handshakes, signal symbols, passwords and fornication as part of worship. In other words, except for a few name changes, the Babylonian religion had survived in its entirety throughout the empire changes. It is from this era that we get the word agnostic. Because those who believed and practiced this religion were called Gnostics, those who did not believe it were considered agnostics. Today the word agnostic is used to refer to someone who says they are unsure or ignorant regarding the existence of God because of a lack of information. Anciently, however, the word agnostic would have identified a person who deliberately desired to remain ignorant of the secret knowledge and rituals through which the Gnostic good god, the serpent and the mystery religion of Babel might be revealed. The name Gnosticism was used for the mysteries right up until the time of Jesus and for some period afterwards. Some Gnostics, in fact, saw in Jesus a similarity between him and their pagan serpent as they believed he was dispensing knowledge of the kingdom of God. Consequently, two Gnostic Christian sects called the Nassenes, so-called because in Hebrew, Nahas means snake, and Ophites, so-called because in Greek, Ophis means snake, worshipped the serpent in the alleged identity of Jesus Messiah. They stole the symbol of the cross and entwined the serpent around it. You may see the symbol interpreted as Christ crucifying the serpent to the cross wherever it is seen, especially in Catholic graveyards but its true blasphemous meaning comes from a Gnostic corruption of Christianity. Gnosticism in Greece also heavily influenced the ancient philosophers such as Socrates and Aristotle, who lived around this time. Their ideas were then passed to Plato, and these three are still revered as the fathers of philosophy. Plato is of particular significance for the New World Order, as we'll discover later. Their so-called wise words are still taught to philosophy students around the world, but much of their ideas are simply ancient Babylonian lies. While the mysteries had become known as Gnosticism in Greece, the Jews had come to know it as Kabbalah by this point, which means hidden secrets. It was also known as the oral secret law. Kabbalah developed mainly through a man called Philo, who adapted or inverted many parts of the Old Testament to fit with Babylonian mysticism. Kabbalah gained a fair amount of popularity in the 200 years prior to Jesus. Today Kabbalah has made something of a resurgence, particularly amongst the rich and famous. It's just the Babylonian mysteries by another name. So to recap, the first kingdom in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was Babylon, the second was Medo-Persia and the third was Greece. What was the fourth? The fourth symbol as seen in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and interpreted by Daniel that of iron legs and feet that were part iron and part clay represents the mighty Roman Empire which conquered the Grecian Empire. The Roman Empire has shaped the history of Europe and the world ever since. Two final things to say about the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Firstly, notice how the value of the metals degrades over time. We start off with gold representing Babylon and end with iron and clay representing Rome. This represents the fact that man-made kingdoms are deteriorating over time. The second point about the statue is that although the value of the metals decreases over time, their strength increases until it becomes iron. This means that as we degenerate in morality, we increase in force and adopt the mentality put forward by Friedrich Nietzsche that might makes right.